everybody. Welcome to the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group. Um, we have a, a very uh, fine audience here in the hall tonight. We also have quite a, a number of members on uh, Zoom as well. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to all our visitors. I see a few in the room tonight. So uh, glad to have you uh, come along to learn about tonight's subject. Tonight, we're going to be talking to you about DMR for Amateur Radio, something most of us here in AREG are, to be frank, still learning about um, because we've only had our DMR repeater alive here in Adelaide for about a month. So lots of people are still learning how to program code plugs and learning all the terminology and the lingo and how it works. So hopefully for those experienced DMR operators out there um, who are watching this, forgive us if we make any silly mistakes, but I think we know what we're doing. Fingers crossed. Um, so without further ado, we've got three speakers tonight. We're going to first of all have Mark 5QI introduce just what the DMR network does. Um, we'll have Ben 5BB go through some of the basics of um, setting up uh, programming things. Um, and then we've got P Peter, VK5DMR, or previously known as VK4, let me see if I get this right, MBL, wasn't it? Um, who's also here. He'll be talking to us live about hotspot technology and it's uh, the ways of accessing the repeaters um, when you're not in radio range. So Mark, without further ado, we'll hand you over and uh, cool. let you get underway. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Mark, VK5QI. Grant, could I get you to jump two slides ahead, please? All right, so in this section of the talk, I'm gonna give a bit of an overview of where DMR kind of came from, uh, why it exists, uh, discuss some terminology. We do need to start this talk with a bit of a termino terminology breakdown because um, there's a lot of terms we're gonna be using later on, um, which if you don't know what they mean, it can become quite confusing, unfortunately. Um, I'll give a bit of an overview on how DMR works at a lower level, the nitty gritty of it. And um, finally, um, conclude this section with a couple of examples of um, how traffic or voice traffic is uh, routed around a DMR network. Our next slide, thanks Grant. So DMR was, a, was developed by the European Telecommunication Standards Institute in 2005, uh, ETSI. Uh, they're also known for such things as a GSM, uh, Tetra, which is another, a, another commercial uh, communication standard. And they're also a member of um, 3GPP, which developed 3G, 4G, and 5G. Uh, the whole point of DMR and other similar systems was mainly to reduce spectral occupancy. So as commercial radio became more and more used, um, you know, your, your oldie 25 kilohertz uh, systems really didn't work too well. Um, they just couldn't fit in the band. Uh, and so they wanted to go to narrower bandwidth systems. Uh, and that either meant, you know, degrading voice quality by going to narrow FM or going to some kind of digital mode. Um, so the aims for DMR uh, were to reduce spectral occupancy, improve voice quality. I'm going to raise some questions on that one, uh, but also add additional features. Um, so be, uh, being able to send data along with the voice, so location information, and also allow for encryption in a very secure manner. Uh, so DMR didn't just come out of one company. Um, it was developed by Etsy, but was adopted by many other manufacturers. And there's now the DMR Association, which has many manufacturers involved. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Grant. And here are some of them. Uh, you may recognize a few of these names. Some you may not expect to, to have DMR radios, um, but they do. Uh, and many which you probably have never heard of. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Grant. So some terminology. So first off, we talk about a DMR ID. Uh, you will need to get one of these at some point if you want to play DMR. DMR ID is your radio's address on the DMR network. Think of it as your call sign. It's a number um, and it can be related back to your call sign through a central database. Now it is worth noting, uh, these IDs are for better or for worse, they are centrally assigned uh, for amateur radio DMR uh, by radioid.net. And there's a lookup table available, which you can download and use in your own um, receiving equipment. So DMR IDs, yes, yeah, just a unique number. Uh, and you can only have one person using a DMR ID at, at any one time on the DMR network. Otherwise, things get very broken. Uh, so next up, we have talk groups. So think of a talk group as a chat room, or if you prefer the term reflector, if you're that way inclined. Um, effectively, it's a way of 
discriminating between you know, groups of uh, conversations. Uh, in traffic to a particular talk group um, from a radio is relayed to any repeater or hotspot configured for that particular talk group. Um, and it's worth noting that your DMR receiver is only going to open mute or produce audio if the talk group ID of associated with the audio you're receiving matches what your radio is programmed and listening for. Next slide, thanks Grant. Uh, DMR has this interesting feature called a color code. Notice the U in brackets there, depends what country you're in, of course. Um, think of it as yet another filtering mechanism. It's kind of like CTCSS in our analog world. Um, commercially, it's there to deal with repeaters which are on the same frequency in the same or well, similar areas. Uh, it helps stop um, transmissions that might be originating from the edge of a repeater's coverage area, getting into an adjacent repeater. Uh, in Australia, for amateur DMR, we just use color code one. If you don't have this right, you won't get into the repeater, unfortunately. Thankfully, the default is almost always color code one. And next up, we have time slots. And I'm going to talk a bit more about time slots later on. Uh, but the short version of it is the repeater can, well, DMR repeaters um, and hotspots in some cases can handle two conversations at once. Uh, separated via time division multiplexing. Again, details a bit later on. Um, so there's two time slots, one and two. And unfortunately, this is where it gets a little bit confusing. There are conventions um, in terms of time slots versus talk groups. So we talk about talk groups and you know, talk group has a certain number. We'll get into what that means and how that works a little bit later on. Uh, unfortunately, um, with DMR repeaters, often they're programmed so certain talk groups only come out or only are accepted on certain time slots. And the point of this is to even out voice traffic. So if you have a talk group that's used very regularly, it might end up on a particular time slot to leave the other time slot free for less used talk groups. So they can both be used, they can both share the repeater at the same time. Uh, there is a lookup table on the vkdmr.com, which provides information on what talk groups are available on what time slots. Moving on, Grant. So this is more about radio programming, not, not DMR specifically. Um, we talk about channels um, in, in, in today's presentation. A channel is more than just a frequency or a TX or RX or an offset. Um, it also contains all sorts of other data. It might contain a readable name. So you can say instead of channel one, this is VK5RWN or whatever. It contains information about talk groups you might want to be talking to or listening for on that particular channel time slot information, color codes, etc. cetera. Um, we also have zones and zones are essentially just a grouping of channels. It's a way of splitting up a, what might be a very large bank of channels in your radio into logical groupings. So for example, uh, channels which are destined for a local repeater or channels which are destined for a hot, your, your own local hotspot. It's a way of keeping them into different groups. So next slide, Grant. So you can kind of think about everything I've just talked about as a bit of a hierarchy. So top level, we have zones. Within those, we have a number of channels and each channel contains information upon radio frequencies that you're using, uh, color codes, time slots, and then the talk group. Um, and on the case of my radio, my MD380, I can see the talk group information and the zone, which I've just called hotspot and also a channel number in this case as well. Okay, moving on, Grant. So the big selling point of DMR is, is all of our repeaters and our hotspots are linked together. Uh, these are linked via a protocol called Internet Protocol Site Connect or IPSC. And this is how DMR repeaters link together. It's a commercial protocol. Uh, this runs on a central server, which forms the core of a DMR network. Um, and the idea behind this software is that it will route voice traffic and potentially other traffic as well between repeaters and hotspots based upon talk group information. Uh, so, you know, the network um, is effectively, this IPSC server is what forms the network effectively. So we have VKDMR, um, there's Brandmeister. It started out with DMR MARC, which was the US kind of DMR Motorola group. Um, but yeah, now there's, there's quite a plethora of um, DMR networks out there all centered around these central servers. Uh, there's usually a status, status page showing activity, um, which I think might be demonstrated later on. 
Um, so VKDMR and Brandmeister's status pages are linked there. So DMR repeaters, um, just like an analog repeater in that you've got to transmit and receive frequency. However, as we talked before, they, they can handle multiple conversations at once. There's two time slots. Uh, they will connect to this central DM, yeah, DMR server by the IPSC protocol uh, and relay audio traffic back and forth filtered by talk group. And as mentioned before, there is an added complexity of certain talk groups um, may end up on certain time slots. Now, we're running at VK5 uh, um, RWN a Motorola repeater. Um, there are homebrew options as well uh, based around the MM and DVM multi-mode digital voice something um, shield, um, which can then plug into other radios. So you can make DMR repeaters and higher powered hotspots yourself if you choose to. So we also have a DMR hotspots. Um, while repeaters, they're operating full duplex, there is a separate TX and RX frequency. Generally, hotspots are simplex. Not always, but mostly they're simplex. Um, and they act as an RF to internet, that central server bridge, um, that IPSC uh, central server. It'll receive traffic from your local, from your radio and passes it onto the server, but which could then relays it onto other repeaters or other hotspots, depending upon talk group. Um, usually, because it's simplex, it's only going to use one of the two time slots and you're in the other time slot. But yes, there are full duplex hotspots. There are also USB dongles. Um, Normally a hotspot is kind of a standalone device. For example, the one shown at the top of the slide there is actually a shield for a Raspberry Pi Zero. This is what I use at home. Um, and it's a standalone unit. It connects to my Wi-Fi um, and, and does, does all the stuff internally. Um, you can get ones that plug in via USB and you run some software on a computer to handle the internet side of it as well. A little bit less convenient perhaps. Finally, this is, one of the interesting things about DMR um, is that um, it uses a proprietary voice codec called AMBE plus. I'm pretty sure it's AMBE plus. Um, and while you may be able to, you know, this, this internet protocol is, is, is open, you can get clients through it, you can connect in and you can receive the data or the voice data. If you don't have the voice codec, you can't convert that back to audio, unfortunately. Um, so to convert it back to audio, you need one of these dongles, which contains their voice codec on a little integrated circuit. Um, and that communicates with your computer and then does the conversion between coded speech and legible audio, audible audio, whatever. Um, and so there again, there's software available. Blue DV is one example where you can connect to a DMR network using a computer and a headset. So no RF involved if you want to if you want to do that kind of thing as well. Uh, these dongles are also important when doing transcoding or linking between DMR and other networks as well. You need to have some way of converting um, the coded audio back to regular audio and then passing it on to a different network, which might use a different codec. For example, DSTAR uses AMBE, not AMBE+. Um, all right, moving on, Grant. So some nitty gritty about DMR. So DMR, over the air uses what we call four FSK or four level frequency shift king at 4,800 bores. So 4,800 symbols per second. Um, that gives an on air bit rate of about 9,600 bits per second, which seems pretty good. Um, but after overheads and forward error correction, that ends up being there about 2,700 bits per second, um, which, is what, which is what we send over the air. The occupied bandwidth is Nominally 12.5 kilohertz. Um, interestingly, the spectrum plot on the right seems to show our repeater being a little bit less than that. So I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, and we have time slots. So we have time division multiplex. Each time slot is 27 and a half milliseconds long. And there's a small gap in between each of them. Now, in the case of simplex DMR operation, where there's where one radio could be transmitting in one time slot and another in another time slot, for example, your hotspot, your hotspot system, your radio has to switch from transmit to receive in roughly two milliseconds, pretty quick. In the case of a repeater, it's operating full duplex. So the transmit side of it is just transmitting continuously, uh, but it's transmitting time slot one trumps time slot two. Um, but it can receive um, two different stations, you know, separated by time slot. 
So yeah, each time slot, approximately 27 and a half milliseconds long. Hang on a second. Um, right. So what's actually being sent over the air? So within that um, 27 and a half milliseconds or so, there's not really much data sent. A few, um, I think it's about 100, maybe 200 bytes thereabouts. Uh, that contains some synchronization information. Um, it contains some signaling. So it tells the um, DMR network and the repeater what is being sent. Is it voice? Is it data? Um, where it's come from, your DMR radio ID. Uh, where it's going to, which is generally going to be a talk group in the case of our operations. And it can also send so, so much more than this. So I spent this afternoon reading through quite a large portion of the DMR standard, about 600 pages. Um, good if you um, can't get to sleep, but anyway. Um, so we can send, the payload can include voice data. Um, it can include positional information as well. Um, you can even send short data messages, SMS. And the standard even supports sending generic IP data in you know, UDP packets. And there's extensions, there's, you know, there's proprietary extensions for almost anything else you can think of. You can send via DMR if you so choose. Um, unfortunately, our VK DMR network does not support positional information or short messages, which is a bit of a shame because they're really fun to play with. Um, other networks like Brandmeister do support these. So if you want to play with those kind of things, you'll have to use a hotspot and connect to the Brandmeister network. So the DMR standard also talks about tiers. There are three different tiers mentioned, uh, one, two, and three. Tier one doesn't really get used very much. The intention behind tier one was cheap, low power radios for things like uh, PMR 466, which is effectively Europe's equivalent of our UHF CB. Uh, yet another way of reducing spectral occupancy, letting more people use spectrum in a cheap radio form factor. I believe some of these radios do exist, but you know, they're probably not, that, probably not that common. They're single time slot, simplex, low power. Then we have tier two, which is where we get into our dual time slot systems. These are intended as a replacement for commercial or existing commercial analog radio networks. This is what we're using for amateur radio. Tier three, we get trunked systems. So this is, think, you know, SAGRN, uh, P25 networks, where you have a control channel and then multiple channels for users. So you transmit, the control channel tells you what channel you're allocated to, and it, you know, it distributes users amongst multiple channels. We don't use any of that in the amateur radio world. Let's have a look at a DMR network in action. Here's a bit of a diagram uh, showing um, a very, very simplified DMI network. We have our central server in the center there. Um, then, and then connected to that, we have a couple of hotspots and a couple of repeaters. And then we have hotspot users running handheld radios and repeater users also running, running radios as well. Uh, next slide, thanks, Grant. Our hotspots and our repeaters can be configured to re relay, relay certain talk groups. So in this case, we have our talk hotspot on the top left-hand corner, which is configured for talk group 505. Um, and that will relay all traffic that it gets on talk group 505 out to RF and vice versa. We have our repeater on the on repeaters on the right. They're both configured for talk group 505. One of them's configured for 3805, which just happens to be the VK5 talk group. Um, and the other one's configured for 3803. Um, which is the uh, VK3 talk group. So what happens when a handheld keys up on talk group 3803? So there's our hotspot user on the bottom left-hand corner. They're transmitting with their handheld, transmitting on talk group 3803. Their hotspot will pick up on that talk group information and will relay their voice through to the central DMR server, which will then relay out to, in this case, repeater two, which is configured to listen on talk group 3803. So all that voice traffic will end up on RF. And if those repeater users on repeater two are listening and their radio is configured for talk group 3803, they will hear that traffic. If they're not configured for that talk group, they won't hear that traffic. So what about talk group 505? We've got a repeater user keying up. Well, first off, the repeater will relay all um, talk group traffic. I believe it will relay it back out to RF anyway, no matter what the talk group is. I could be wrong on that one. 
Uh, but of course, TalkGroup 505 is going to get relayed to the central DMR server and back out to everyone connected listening on TalkGroup 505. So it's going to end up at repeater two and a hotspot, uh, the hotspot on the top left-hand corner. Finally, what happens if a user on repeater one keys up on a entirely different talk group? So, you know, the repeater is normally configured to relay traffic on talk group 505 and talk group 3805, but the handheld is just keyed up on talk group 3803. So what the repeater will do is it will go, all right, I've got a new talk group. It'll relay the traffic out to the network as normal. So we have a hotspot and another repeater already configured for that talk group, which will be which will send out that voice traffic and those users might hear it. What the repeater will do is it'll add that talk group to a list. And for a certain period of time, I believe the default on VKDMR is about 15 seconds, any voice traffic coming off the central DMR server on that talk group will get relayed back out to RF. If there's no traffic for a certain period of time, then that talk group will get dropped from the list and no more traffic on that talk group will get relayed through. We call this a dynamic talk group as opposed to a static talk group. In the case of VKDMR, um, normally all repeaters will have a certain set of static talk groups. 505 is pretty much all on all VKDMR repeaters and also local state talk groups such as 3805 for VK5, 3803 for VK3. These are static talk groups that are always present. All righty, I'll hand over to Ben to talk about collecting and programming DMR radios. Hey, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, next slide, please, uh, Grant. There's plenty of radios out there. Um, so what's on the marketplace and what do you want? Well, if you're looking at handhelds, there's a list here. Um, it's a list I've found. Uh, some people find uh, others. You can go to the usual online sites and uh, type in DMR portables and you get a range of them. But the Anytone, uh, BTEC, TYT, uh, the Retitivus, and some of these things, when you look at them, you start to think, well, where do they come from? Uh, they all look like they come out of the same factory. They probably do. And they got badge engineering on them. Um, Alenco, Radio Oddity, and the Bofongs. Um, now, the, the list up there are those that are, I know are all tier two, which is what we need to use. Um, so just be careful that um, when you're doing some research, that you make sure they are tier two and not tier one. What some of the clues to it might be that uh, when they uh, in their advertising is that um, they'll do the two time slots. There's a few Bofongs and a couple of others out there that won't do tier two at all. And it's important that you don't use tier one radios on the DMR network because it wipes out both um, time slots. Next slide, thanks, Grant. If you're a bit more upmarket and you're looking at uh, mobiles, um, there are a range of mobiles around. Uh, the Anytone, the Anytone's top of the range, I think. And it's just my playing, it's my thoughts, uh, things. TYT are very good. And uh, the clones of the TYT, the Red Tiff is. Um, and the Elenco, and I've heard good reports about the Elenco, and one I've shown in there, the uh, MD520T is a tri band unit. So, you probably don't want to import that one because you've got 220 megs on it, which we don't use here. Of course, there's uh, the commercial brands too. So a lot of people have been to the government sales. So you can get uh, Motorola radios. Uh, it's Kenwood, Icom. Uh, one that was very common in the early days of um, uh, HAM DMR was the Hytera uh, radios as well. Um, but Hytera and Motorola had a big fallout along the way. But there's others there, and um, just be careful if you decide to go for them. Is One of the things you need to make sure you get is the uh, CPS or the uh, code plug programming software. Um, sometimes it can be very, very hard to get or can be expensive. Next slide, Mark. Thanks. Uh, Grant, sorry. Okay. You're looking at programming a radio, you need to organize yourself. Um, you're going to set up your computer with your CPS, etc. Set up the 
some folders to download um, irrelevant files, copies of code plugs. Um, there are things like as CSV files. Uh, if you want to import stuff into your code plug, put them somewhere where you can find them. Now, you'll need your own DMR ID. I think this has been well and truly hammered, but some people may not be aware. It's basically if you can't start programming until you've got it. So you do, the, do yourself a favour, get yourself a copy, a DMR ID. Log in uh, to radioid.net and set up an account. Um, it's free to do the initial thing and apply for your DMR ID. And this will take uh, one to three days. Um, mine turned around in, in, in one day, so it's, it's not too bad. But um, even if you don't, if you're into some of the other um, digital voice radios like uh, uh, D Star and uh, Yesu C4FM, um, it's still useful to have a DMR ID so that. Um, if you go on to some of the reflectors and uh, talk groups, um, it, it goes across the, the whole network sort of thing. Next slide, Grant. Thank you. Um, you'll need the code plug software. Um, the Anytome one I got from a non-brand site. Um, there's a couple other sites out there. Uh, some of the major manufacturers um, or the major retailers like um, DX Engineering, uh, PowerWorks, who do the uh, um, a range of products as well. They've got lists of um, uh, where you can download the CPS for your particular radio, if, especially if it's one that they sell. So sometimes the retailer can be a good link um, and it's relatively simple. So download your CPS and install it on the computer that you plan to do your programming from. Um, there is some open source cross-platform programming, uh, QDMR. Um, most people generally use the one from the, uh, that matches the brand of radio. And I was playing with um, a TYT uh, code plug uh, and uh, I've been given three, well, I've got three different code plug software from different suppliers that'll all read the same TYT code plug. I've not played with the uh, uh, cross-platform stuff, so uh, and I believe from Mark uh, QI advised that it's available for Linux. So those that want to play, there's another option for you. Next slide, please, Grant. Okay, now code plug. This is a term that get knocked around a bit um, people talk about it and they generally talk about it for um, um, the digital voice radios or the digital radios uh, I'm not sure where the term code plug come from it sounds like it might be a, one of those Motorola things a bit like PL or private line which is Motorola's term for CTCSS but the code plug is the personality file it carries all the information that you need uh, within the radio to set it up and customise it to do your job. So it carries a lot of information. Um, it even carries the um, software and firmware versions for that radio. So one of the issues you may have when you're trying to uh, program your radio, um, you've got to make sure that you've got the right information for like the firmware version. So the best thing to do is when you get your code plug software up and running is to read your radio download the initial specs on the radio so that you've got a copy of the, those parameters it's customizable this is where you do set all your things so you'll set your your channel frequency so that's your receive transmit frequency for your repeater for your hotspot um it'll carry if you've got the dual mode radios and most of the radios we're talking about are analog and digital so you can set your mode uh, and along with the mode, you can also set the bandwidth. The bandwidth will be limited to 12.5 for DMR, but you can open it out to 20, 25 kilohertz for uh, analog, and you need to do that. Otherwise, your FM audio will be pretty thin. You set your CT CSS for analog uh, where needed. 
And on the um, DMA, you set the colour code and the time slots. Now, the time slots have got to match the talk groups. So you need to look at your talk groups to work out which time slot you're going to use on that channel. So plan your, uh, your channels. Next group. Uh, next slide, please, Grant. Design your channel plan. It's important. Sit down and do a little bit of legwork. Get a piece of paper out, scribble all over it. You need to work out what you want. So um, your analog channels, your talk groups, you need to put it all down because if it's not in your code plug, generally you'll not be able to talk to it. So if you get wind of there's another talk group out there that um, you'd like to get into because it's uh, it's put up by a group that's got a subject topic that's of interest to you. If it's not in your radio, it'll be difficult to put it in through the front panel. There are a couple of brands or radios that you can do it through the front panel at a contact. I believe the Anytone does. I've had seen it in mine. But uh, most of the others, you can't cannot add um, additional contacts through the front panel. So sit down, work out what you need your radio to cover. Um, if it's dual mode, so analog and digital, take advantage of it. Put your analog channels in and also uh, your simplex and put your repeaters. In your DMR, set it up for uh, the local DMR repeater initially. Uh, and perhaps if you're running a hotspot because you're out of range of the repeater normally, put your hotspot frequencies in there and then you can work out the talk groups. So in the DMR talk groups, think about it. Have a look at the list, see where they connect to, what they are, what you need now and what you might want later because you can add them to your talk group list and not necessarily use them, but you have them there. So next time you want to program, you don't have to keep working out where they are. Next slide, please, Grant. Okay. Uh, word of caution here. <laughs> um, you can probably get code plug uh, versions from mates who have already got a radio the same as yours, and they said, oh, well, just export it, and you can just edit out your, the DMR ID and uh, put it in. That's all very well, um, and you, 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 you can do that. Um, one of the catch, uh, and I got caught by this, is the code plug that was given to me. I couldn't import it into my radio because the firmware version of the original source didn't match my radio. So I had to do some jiggery-pokery and export it and re-import it through uh, other means. Um, the code plug, and I call it 30 generation, but it may not be. It might only be fifth generation, but you know what I mean. Ones I've looked at that have uh, been sent my way to have a look at, they've got a lot of unwanted and unneeded data, um, especially if you're just starting off uh, fresh. You want to put your local repeater or repeaters that you might go past in there, and then you want to get rid of all the others. One of the problems I found is uh, I cleaned up my talk group list and I tried programming the radio and you got these tables in front of you and the programmer. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all in, in order. That's right. Yeah, beauty. Save that. Load the radio. And then as I toggled through the uh, uh, radio, it didn't come out in the same order. And what I discovered was is that there were hidden channels further up the list that still had talk groups that I had tried to eliminate. So it was being uh, these hidden channels were corrupting the programming. So just be warned. So the best practice is, and this can be daunting for new people, is to start with a clean, clean code plug and uh, do it in. You just got to remember, it's relatively simple if you take a logical approach. Next. Uh, thanks, Grant. Points to consider, uh, most radios that we're looking at are 2 and 70 centimetre and dual mode. So uh, you take advantage of that. You can put all your two metre uh, channels in it, your 70 centimetre analog channels, and you can add your uh, local DMR repeater as well. Um, plan and list all this, so sit down and type it out or write it out. 
um, use the resources available. Uh, in my case, for because I'm VK5, um, the South Australian YSEN group regularly publish a, an up-to-date listing of all VK5 repeaters and a range of simplex uh, channels as well. So uh, it was easy to do that. And it just is one of the things about doing code plugs, you're going to spend a lot of time on your computer and done a lot of typing. Research and list all the talk groups that you may use or want to use. Have a look at some of the others. Um, you may not be interested today, but it's a table in your code plug uh, software and you can add them in there uh, for later use. So have a look at the uh, VKDMR um, uh, pages. You'll find a lot of useful information there about talk groups, where they connect to, and the time slots that they use. Thanks, Grant. Um, you need to note the um, time slot for each talk group. So talk group 505 is time slot two. Uh, talk group nine, which is for your local repeater, so it's confined to your local repeater only, uses time slot one. So the idea here is that if a couple of locals want to have a chat with each other in the footprint of the local repeater, they don't inhibit um, 505, which is on time slot two, from putting out calls and other people can then use it. Um, so that's the beauty about it, sort of thing. Um, Again, the VKDMR web pages is a good, plenty of information there. And if you drill around and you'll find um, uh, links off elsewhere, but additional information too. Um, here, looking at a minimal list um, that I programmed up and, and it's a starting point um, is to look at what you want. So talk group nine, uh, 505, which is the uh, Australian call channel. And it goes wider than that because there's a lot of other people connected in to the system too. So they'll hear it around the world. Um, now, talk group nine is time slot one. So it's local. Uh, 505 is time slot two. So time slot two generally here in Australia, generally, it's not exclusively, is provides linking out to all the other systems. The exception here is actually um, talk group five, which is a net channel uh, commonly used for VK nets. That's a time slot one. So while the nets are going, they don't inhibit the use of 505 or uh, other talk groups. Add your state talk groups in. Uh, you can add them into the list uh, and you can look them up uh, if and when you need them. If uh, it's not on, say, VK5, uh, RWN, for example, doesn't have um, the Western Australian talk group 3806. It's easy. You dial up 3806 uh, on your radio. You can chunk the system, hold the uh, PDD for a couple of seconds to allow all the handshaking and so on, and you'll add it to the um, talk groups available through the thing, and you'll also wake up Western Australia and anybody else listening to it. Uh, and as I understand, um, when you add a, a dynamic talk group to the repeater, it stays there for 15 minutes. And if you watch the dashboard, you'll see it timing out or timing down, counting down. So, general chat talk groups 3800, 3809, uh, 3810 is actually a YSEN channel, but it's available for uh, general use. And Parrot, which I can't make work here locally, is. Um, is triple nine zero on um, time slot two. Uh, and the idea of that is that you can make a recording or you can put out your call sign and the repeater will parrot it back to you so you can hear what your own audio levels are. So that's the function of it. Uh, it's relatively new. There's information on VKDMR about it, but I've not been able to make it work. I've seen activity, but not come back. It's something to be looked at. Next slide, please, Grant. Ah, it's over to Peter. Okay, so thank you very much, Ben. Just give us a minute while we reconfigure to send video <laughs> from here. Um, you want to switch the vision switcher? And I will do that. So I'd like to introduce to you now Peter, 5DMR. 
who will uh, talk to us a little bit more about operating and hotspots in general. Hey, thanks there, uh, Grant, and uh, good evening all. I'll say good evening, folks. I don't know if there's any ladies uh, listening or whatever. Sorry, that's a Queensland thing coming from up there. Um, just a little story was that um, Queen Palaget uh, decreed that, um, or Queen Palachuk, as we used to call her, you know, decreed that uh, we should greet everyone as saying, good evening, folks. Good day, folks. How are you? It, was, it came in on uh, the um, uh, one of those Commonwealth game um, things that was on the, the, the Gold Coast one day. Um, the... Um, that other crowd, you know, that uh, and the Greens uh, decided that you know they didn't like uh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, you know, Mister and uh, Ma'am and Miss and everything that we'd grown up with, whatever, had to be something different. So we had to call everyone folks, so that there was no non-discriminatory thing you know, in that uh, tone of voice. But anyway, so it's a normal thing that I just say, "Good evening, folks," but you know. Uh, so be it. Um, there's a couple of things that um, the guys have gone through beforehand, and I totally agree. There's the website, the vkdmar.com. I can really recommend that one as a good read. There was a lot of information. You drill down through the pages. You see the talk groups, the time slots, and you'll get an idea of you know, what's really going on on that one there. It's done by a guy called uh, a good friend of mine, Glenn. VK4DU, he runs uh, that uh, those pages, and um, yes, no, I've had him round for lunch and uh, and everything, and uh, you know we've discussed little things and tips and tricks and whatever. So it's a good web page. I really do recommend going and looking at it. If anyone comes up on my net that yeah and is new, I say look, go to those web pages. Yeah, you know, it's the bible as far as I'm concerned. It's got all the information needed. If you've got questions, please come back to me um, and I'll endeavour and 99% uh, of them I can normally answer. Now, as um, as Grant said, my call sign is VK4NBL slash VK5DMR. Nobody had it, so I applied and I got it. So it was there. So there for the taking, while I was applying for um, another uh, DMR repeater uh, to go in at Murray Bridge. So I've applied for and got VK five RMU. No, not not taken. No, I'll grab it. No. Anyway, it's all set to go. And um, if I, uh, depending on what sort of weekend I have, and, and uh, if I get all the uh, the hardware bits together, I'll uh, set it up at home and uh, give it a pull through and make sure it all works and whatever. It um, next month will go up to the top of White Hill overlooking Murray Bridge. Um, you know, you, there'll be a gap, obviously, be, uh, between RWN and if you're heading east, uh, of course, but I expect somewhere from about Mount Barker onwards, um, you'll go down the river to Manham or up the river to Manham, I should say, losing my directions. It'll go down the river to the Kurong, um, and it should get down. Yeah, well past tail and bend anyway into that. So from White Hill, it should give a good coverage uh, out to the east. So next month, that one will be on air and uh, we'll have a second repeater again here in Adelaide then. So a lot of things that I was going to talk about, but Grant said I only had 10 minutes and said, that's it. So I thought, okay. Yeah, it's getting close. I've got way less than there. So I'll nip through a few things onto that. Um, hot spots. So I brought several along. Not everything that I have, but I have a few sitting home that are not being used, and I'll put them into other other uses. So going across from um, right to left, or left to right, whatever, going that direction. So um, I have a uh, a travel spot. Uh, this one here. Uh, I use on D-Star and use an ID 51 on that one. Um, I have a, um, a Shack Spot 2 Plus, which I use um, an APX 6000 Motorola on P25. Uh, I've got a dual hotspot, which is the Shack Spot Pro 2 uh, duplex, 
Uh, I run a um, Retibus RT3S through that one there. So if you see me come up as VK4NBL, I'm using that combination. Um, if you see me come up as VK5DMR, I'm using the new Anytone and a single hotspot down the far end, which is a, a Jura Spot 2. And right at the very end, um, I haven't been doing much. This is the Yezu confusion side of things. So I've got an FT2D and I've got an open spot two. So I started off um, with, uh, with DMR and hotspots probably about 15 plus years ago. Um, at that stage, we only had one repeater in Queensland that was in Brisbane and I had to travel 25 kilometres in my car before I could hit the repeater because I was even beyond a range from that one there. Um, that was using a Kinect Systems CS800. That's another brand that's out there. Uh, I've had several of those radios because they're built like the brick outhouse. They remind me of the Yazoo Vertex standard of radios, the commercial side of it. They are very solid. You know, you see the picture of the Land Rover driving over one of them on that one there. I actually did test it out one day and the radio was still working and still quite good. So that impressed me. So I sold that and bought a, a CS800 Delta. And then I bought the next version of the 800 Delta, which um, is UV. Um, and each company is trying to outdo the next company, of course, because there's so many out there. At this the time, it's... I spoke to Mark and got the AREG group buyer on the, um, where are we, the Anytones on that one there. And I know that he got those in at an extremely good price compared to the retail price. I was disappointed, but no one went up there at the car boot sale and said thank you to him and to that. Um, so he did uh, a good deal definitely for the club onto that one there. Uh, moving along, it's like I said, I started about 15 odd years ago um, with an open spot one and a, um, a Connect Systems handheld, which was, uh, I think it was a CS580, uh, very basic uh, radio onto that one there. Open spot one, um, if you can imagine like a Pi Star, de decent sized box. And it, um, it didn't have Wi-Fi or anything. It was just purely Ethernet uh, into that. So that was the first start. I started on that on the dark side. I went to Brainmeister. Um, and I thought it was pretty good that I could sit out in the back garden with a handheld and talk to someone in the UK. And I thought, this is magic. It really was. And uh, that one there. But um, I progressed and grew up and I went to... DMR mark or the DMR side of uh, things on that one there. Anyway, it was all good fun. There was lots of experimenting back in those days uh, of what you could do. Um, all these hotspots currently, and what I do at home, I run them into this Telstra dongle. So that's all I use for the network for my, uh, my hotspots um, is purely that one there. Now, I'll talk about other options from the dongle as we sort of get along. So I'll quickly go through a few things. Firstly, have a look at um, the repeater and the hotspot server. And that's come up on some slides there before. Uh, rpt.vkdmr.com and hot.vkdmr.com. So that's your um, repeater server and your hotspot server. Two servers are located in Sydney. Onto that, they are the Australian service for uh, um, VKDMR. And we've dropped the, uh, the mark now, we just call it VKDMR. But there are servers located all around the world for the different sorts of uh, um, Yep. No, no, not at all. You just log on to the New Zealand server or, or 
another country server yeah and keep going until that one there it's like um one day the the repeater will drop off on that one there doesn't mean it's the end of the world that repeater is still going 99 out of 100 times the network's dropped off for some unbeknown reason that repeater up there on the hill is still working we can all still use it you know you just like grant maybe on 3805 maybe on 505 maybe on nine and you can still talk up and down to each other right it will still work uh into that until the repeater the network comes back online and then you get connected back to the rest of australia onto that one there um as i said the servers in sydney um one of the things when you do set up your hotspots please do not set them up in the satellite band which is about 435 to 438 megs if i remember rightly somewhere about there uh, is that you can go and set up the frequency 70 centimeter frequency almost wherever you want to if you go to the um the dashboard and look at the hotspot server you'll be there's a number of tags down the left hand side of the page just go to that and click on them and bucket loads of information comes up there's one particular page that comes up and tells you where everyone the name the call sign the location what frequency they're using on their hotspot you know, and it gives you all this other information across there very interesting you can get an idea of what frequency everyone's using on their hotspot it's on the hotspot uh vkdmr.com the web the the server onto that information but please out of those three megs stay out of it or they go below or most people go above keeping in mind that the number of people here run ft8 on the digital so it's a qrp type uh, arrangement so you're looking at getting contacts around the world on five watts two watts one watt right you're getting that distance um and it's got to go out of the crud through the the ionosphere back down again through the crud and you're getting those signals on that sort of low power these things here put them down to the minimum amount of power and you always run your radios on low power uh it's all you need until that one and you're amazed at what sort of distance you can get on the lowest power rating on your poster um be it 10 milliwatts or somewhere even lower and your radio is on low which is probably one watt or something maybe half a watt you can still get around the house and the outside you know, where you want to go and that's all you want to do into that one if you run the high power uh, onto that and it's a signal and it's basically going out but it's also going straight up and that's where it can start to interfere with the satellites on that because the you know they are trying to get their small signal you know back down to everyone that's trying to operate through the satellites and i did that heck or lot up in queensland in fact now the story is one of my favorite ones is we used to uh, run slow scan tv through the satellites and so i had a page a picture made up um because i was in queensland and a lot of people would talk to us in new south wales down through the satellites but uh, depending on the satellite and the footprint so the little picture i had was of two cane totes one in a car and one with a little swag over his back there and in the background was this uh, sign that said sydney and that's where they were heading to so i'd send that down to the sydney guys you know, up through the satellites and back down again there uh, anyway uh, we get a bubble get out of this what i was trying to say um all right we talked about the website it's got a wealth of information and glenn 40 u is is running that one there um in setting up your hotspot you can put in five time slot one and five time slot two talk groups i don't recommend that don't don't do it in in the hotspots maybe put two 
in time slot two and two in time slot one. What happens? Most people are running single hotspots onto there. If you are talking on a talk group, be it talk group five, for example, and there is a gap between the conversation you and the next guy talking to you, and someone's come up on talk group 505, all right, or one of the other talk groups you've got in uh, as your, um, your static talk group, the hotspot will take off. It'll go off to that talk group. And you'll go back and say, I missed you. Couldn't hear anything. And you're talking on 505. But you're not really. You're actually talking on 505. Why did I jump you know, on that one there? Because people a lot, you know, program these up with far too many um, talk groups into that. They think that, oh, I can open it up. It will do um, this thing will do DMR, it will do Yezu Fusion, it will do P25, it will do NXDN. I'll turn them all on. I can have a listen. Well, no, you can't. You've only got a DMR radio. Why the hell turn off the rest of them then? Same as putting in all these other talk groups onto there. Is that you will have problems. I'll tell you right now, it's just a tip for young players. Onto that. On the VK, this is, a, this is a blatant plug. VK DMR net, Tuesday nights, uh, talk group five, time slot one, seven o'clock local. Three weeks' time, it'll be the fourth anniversary that I've been running that net. Well, about four years we've run that, and we get people all around the country. I have little competitions from time to time. Who can call in from the most east and west and north and south point of the country? And I've got guys that have said, right, I'm going to get you. I'll go. One guy went up to Papua New Guinea because a guy kept going up almost to Cape York and calling in, and he always had the most northern. So another guy went up into Papua New Guinea. He called in. Uh, he got uh, the prize for that night there. Uh, Tuesday night. Um, seven o'clock local for um, uh, non daylight saving, whatever. I've got to get used to that because we don't have daylight saving in Queensland. Yeah, talk group five, which is a time slot one. So, yes, no daylight saving in Queensland. But someone did warn, warn me when I left South Australia to go to Queensland. As soon as you cross the border, mate, put your clock back 20 years. Nothing. And he was bloody right, too. I can't tell you. Oh, goodness me. Anyway. Um, if you've got in your, your hotspot, you've put in, you know, what I've put into mine is um, I've got talk group 505, 505 and 3805. Uh, for time slot two, and I don't know, okay. Um, time slot one, talk group five, talk group 53. You know, if you get on to 505, yeah, you can have short conversations, but if you're going to have a long one, go off to a time slot one. Keeping in mind, if you go off 505 onto 3805, you haven't moved, you're still on time slot two. Right, you're locking it up for everyone else. So go on to a time slot one. Yeah, you know, be it, and there's a whole number of them. Have a look on that vkdmr.com website. They'll give you all the others. Onto that one there. Uh, if, you, if someone calls and say, "Look, go on 3804, for example," okay, you go to 3804. You've got a, a chunk for two seconds, and then listen. No conversations. Yep, call up on that one there. It's normal etiquette on that one there. Um, let's see. On the carry on the uh, the repeater network, there's like almost sixty repeaters around Australia. It's the biggest amateur digital network in the country, and you know I think we were about fifty-seven with our repeater that we got up there, uh, and that which is great. There's also 13 channels that are cross-linked, or well, there's about 10 channels cross-linked to Brandmeister. 
which is against my better judgment, but that's only me personally. There's also about 13 channels cross-linked to Yezu Fusion. So the number of guys come onto the VKDMA net, they've all got Yezu Fusion radios. So there is one that comes into Talk Group 5. So that's also possible as well. It's always good fun to try and do the you know, crossing on that one there. So we talked about the, uh, uh, the net. Um, when to use um, hotspots, we'll make this the last one there, Grant, anyway. There's a number of other things, we use that one there. Use a hotspot when you're out of repeater range. So I've said that um, um, I can jump on uh, the VK DMR net or um, the network, and I'm running through a Telstra dongle. Now, that could also be um, a, uh, any sort of dongle. It could also be um, your mobile phone. So you can make your mobile phone. Most of the mobile phones these days, you can turn into hotspots. So you can run through that one there. So you can take away your phone, your radio, your hotspot, and away you go. Anywhere in the country that you've got phone range, whatever, carrier, doesn't matter, you're in network range for VKDMR into there. So mobile phone, radio, your hotspot, Take away at holidays, you can sneak into the bottom of the luggage that the missus doesn't know, and away you go. You can have some fun on that one there. Okay, there's a lot of other information. Like I said, it's, I don't profess to be an expert because we know what an expert is, don't we? All right, so I've played around for about 15 odd years. Um, I've been up in um, Queensland about that time, I've come back. And as most people know, my younger son has Downs and I've found that South Australia is the best state for kiddies with disability. So I've moved back here, mainly because of him, and pretty happy that I've joined ARIC. Uh, out of all the clubs I've been through, it's the most progressive club definitely on that one there. Anyway, got any questions, please catch me up at any time on that one there. All right, thanks, Grant. Okay, thank you, Peter. Now... I know there's a number of people here who no doubt have lots of questions since we've only had our DMR for a short time. We'll just take a few questions now. Um, just for the AREG members who uh, are not, haven't already caught up with the news, we are planning on running a programming and, and DMR deep dive night um, probably in the next two to four weeks. So for the members, um, that'll be something that we'll, we'll announce. And uh, if you want to come along and learn a lot more in depth, um, it's a perfect opportunity. But right now, do we have any uh relatively short questions that hopefully we can get answered from the panel of Ben, Mark, or uh, Peter. Ian, over to you. Hang on. I've got quite a few, but I'll, I'll ask the one that's at the top of my mind. Um, if I'm using my radio and I'm working through the repeater, I don't have a hotspot. I've just bought one of these things. I've had it for a couple of weeks now, trying to get my head around all the code flows and things like that. And when... You know, if I'm looking at the radio, there's a little green lead comes on when it's receiving RF, but I don't hear anything because I'm not on whatever talk group I'm listening to. So how do I know if I decide to transmit, am I going to jump on top of somebody else? Because, you know, I see the light come on. I've got no idea whether that's a transmission on time slot one, time slot two, or what it is. And I want to use the thing. You know, I may be transmitting on the same time slot as that conversation, or I may be on the other one. I've got no way of knowing. Um, is there any way around that? I mean, assuming I don't have a PC in front of me looking at the dashboard to see what's going on. Hang on a sec. Look at, um, uh, look at uh, the, um, the front of your hotspot. Don't have a hotspot. Don't have a only hotspot. using the repeater. You're only talking up via radio to the repeater. Well, that will leave. Well, you put out a call and this if the green light's on then it's receiving something else in your list of static talk groups yes right not necessarily the one you're on no but you just go to your other static talk groups and you'll find so i'd have to sort of basically step through the talk groups and see of course by the time i get to the one that had the green light on they might have stopped by the time they get <laughs> yeah oh look dead dead certain on that one and, and they will <laughs> they will so, I mean, but, but you can just jump on and talk. You're obviously not on that static talk group. So someone else is on another static talk group. Now, the only time it may 
I, I'm, just con through. I'm just concerned that the one that's being used is on the same same time slot yep. that I want to use. Yep. You know, so uh, I'm, your, I'm your radio won't allow else. you to transmit if you're on, if there's already a transmission occurring. That's right. Yes, the, you won't get through. I was going to just say yeah, but that. Yeah, if I jump in in the gap in between their ovals or something. It's, yeah. Okay. Yours, yours would go through on yeah. on whatever talk group you're on, and I might blow them out. out. It's, it's one of those things with a network, right, definitely okay. on that one there. Yeah. But if the if the green light is on, one of your static talk groups is active. You jump on and talk. If it doesn't go through, they're on the same time slot as right. you. Yeah, on that one there. So it's yeah. I try and bring the point that. Um, um, if you're on 505 and you go to 3805, it doesn't make any difference. You're still, if someone else on you know, 505 can't talk because yep. you're still occupying time slot two. That's why I say that QSY head off to a time slot one um, you know, on that one there. So it's like a pretty Maradia 505 and 3805, talk group five, talk group 53. Yeah, one of the other ones is not going to be active. You know, just yeah. you know, go over there, um, yeah, and listen. No conversations. Yep, jump. It's the same I mean, as getting on an analog. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was looking at this dashboard today, and there was a couple of EK4s popping in there on three eight oh four. Yep. So I thought, oh, I wonder what they're talking about. So I just ka -chunk, yeah, ka -chunk it and listen in. Of course, I'm and I'm listening into them, but yeah. it's that's obviously tied up. 505 then as well because that's in that's in that state in that, yes or here yes yeah 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 to be honest don't worry about, don't worry about it. it there's not enough traffic to, to really be an issue i think yeah <laughs> all right uh we have another question here from uh, paul just, just to expand on that gentleman was saying in the radio if it comes up with a green light in analog systems that have a lot to do with in commercial systems the green light would come up to show rf channel activity Mm -hmm. they, uh, they also were enabled with what we call the transmit inhibit channel busy transmit inhibit is that the same sort of function it's, it's it definitely sounds like the same thing people no worries that uh, you won't be able to, to transmit on that one there because the time slot's already occupied on a, on another static talk group but you don't know whether it's a time slot two or a time slot one it's only one of those static talk groups in your radio you might talk on, you know, call on 505 and yep, someone's going to answer you. So then you'll know that other one is one of your static time slot one, ones okay. into that one there. Okay, thank you. We've got a question here from Chris. Okay, this, this one is a bit of a technical one. So when I press the button on my Anytone, um, it feels like the handshakes between it and the server for, um, I don't know, a quarter of a second or so. And then essentially it gives me the green light to talk. Not sure whether this is you or Mark. Well, um, what's happening in that process? Yeah, yes, my, you, you are correct in that one. There is there's a handshake going on between your radio and the repeater, and then it's indicating back to you. It happens in that sort of time limit until that one there is that you might see a a green light and then a red light until that one there. The green light is the handshake. Yep, it's uh, open, free. Talk to me. And the red light is you transmitting uh, onto that one there. Yep. Okay, do we have any other questions? Yes, Kim. Um, I've seen a bunch of um, open spot twos and threes pop up recently. Um, are they worth picking up? Um, like of the of the access, the, sorry, the, the hotspots you have there, yep. um, what's actually what available in Australia? Because a lot of this stuff seems okay. to ship from overseas. Okay, all right. One point I missed because I've got that <laughs> you know, sig signal. On that one there. Yep, that, that is an open spot two. They have open spot threes, and I think they have an open spot four now. Yeah, yeah. Where's it going in? But anyway, um, these other hot spots here, um, I deal with one particular person. Now, if you buy something um, from a company, um, and you trust what the salesman telling you, and then you trust the product, you then go back to buy more. I've dealt with a guy in Queensland, another Glenn, VK4NGA. Um, if you Google VK4NGA digital, he has the series of hotspots on that one there that he sells on that. In the early days, going back you know, 15 odd years ago, I used to get hotspots off eBay from China. 
Holy shit. Anyway, the the biggest problem that they had in the early days were the TXCOs. They were as broad as a barn door. You could drive a tank through them. You, you, know, you would spend weeks doing the TX and the RX, RX offset to lock it into your radio on that one there. The guy that sells these has gone through and if you give him your, um, your modem router password details, he'll put that into this and it'll come back as a plug and play uh, device uh, to you that you can use it. It won't be like Windows, you know, plug and pray. It'll be def a definite, and I'll guarantee it, a plug and play out of the box after that. He has a whole series of that one there. So he has singles um, and he has you know, jewels. I use the jewel only for DMR to that. So if I'm running the DMR net on this particular one, I'll go into my dashboard um, for that and I will put talk at five only. I'll take out the other ones because another, like I said, little trip, trick for young players. You've got all these other talk groups static in there. I'll jump between them, you know, when there's a gap on one, and you know, suddenly you'll find yourself on another talk group and you never wanted to go there. So I'll put talk group five only on that one there. On the dual hotspot, I'll leave whatever I've got. It doesn't make any difference. It's locked onto that talk group I'm talking to. Okay, we have another question here from Bent. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, but when I got my uh, ID, I didn't have a hotspot because I'm in an area where I'm not covered by our repeater. So I started up with my Lime SDR and tried to do a soft uh, solution, software-defined radio solution. So I'm halfway there. I haven't got it quite to run yet. But I wonder if you know anyone else that has a software-defined radio on the uh, as a hotspot. Uh, not not down here, I don't, and I've got to admit that I have not gone down that path to to learn about um, the Lime STR. Uh, I've had people I've known up in Queensland have done it you know, to that. How successful? I couldn't tell you honestly. I do I do not know. There is far too many different hotspots and different things, and uh, Mark attested to uh, little ambi dongles and God knows what else. Yep. Yeah. Oh, look, I'm sorry, I can't help you on that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're very short of time now. I'm just going to open the questions. Is there anybody on Zoom um, from the members who has a question they'd also like to ask? No. Do we have any no, more questions? Go ahead, Kerry. Go Sorry. Go ahead, Kerry. Probably. Um, be going the opposite way if someone two people are talking on a talk group and they'd just like to effectively go simplex via dmr is that possible or are you always choosing a talk group to just basically have a one-on-one -on -one conversation you can go simplex uh, through the repeater um like by going to somewhere like talk group nine um which there's only one repeater in South Australia, so it doesn't mean anything at the moment until we get a multitude of repeaters. Uh, you can go to any other time slot one talk group and talk to that person uh, onto that. You can also go to 439.200. Uh, that is a link talk group 99. That is a simplex frequency on VKDMR. So the opportunities are there for you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from Zoom? Okay. There's a couple more on the floor. I'm going to take one more tonight, folks, and I would then strongly encourage everybody to come along to the uh, the tune-up night. Uh, that's going to be a, a more detailed opportunity to ask you questions. But Ian's begged me, so I'm going to let, I'm going to let Ian ask one more question. Okay. The talk groups. Let's say I fancied having a talk group to discuss some weird topic. Who sets up the talk groups, creates them, like the numbers? The talk groups on the VK DMR network are set by a fellow called Peter, VK3TE, uh, ex-Melbourne, now Sunshine Coast. So he will 
in conjunction with other people that suggest talk groups. He may or may not put an extra one on there. He has put 10 extra talk groups, talk group 30 to 39 for Jota, uh, but yet turns them on and off for that particular weekend. But if you've got um, something you want to discuss, I'd probably say go to Brainmeister because they have got I would need a hotspot to access that. Can't do it through this repeater. No, probably, you know, you'd have to go through a hotspot to do it, yes, and, and go put your hotspot onto the Brand Meister network. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Look, we are out of time, um, but I would very much like to thank all of our presenters this evening in uh, Mark 5QI, Ben 5BB, and uh, Peter 5DMR. Hopefully everybody's learned a little bit about DMR tonight. and. Um, as I said, for the members, we're going to have a, uh, a DMR tune-up in a couple of weeks' time. We'll let you know when that's happening and there'll be opportunity to bring your gear down to the hall, um, set up your programmers, and go DMR crazy. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much online for uh, all the members who have been tuned in on Zoom. And also, uh, good evening to all of our YouTube audience. Um, that's all tonight from ARIG. For the members, please stand by. We'll have a short break, and then we'll be uh, starting our general meeting. Good night, all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Hayden.